And so let's talk about these final rewards tonight. And let's go to the judgment seat of Christ. And normally, if you come normally, you know I just open up with reading a passage of scripture, but we're gonna walk our way through three passages of scripture tonight. And I want you to be encouraged and I want you to be motivated. And I want you to just go ahead and and leave room for an opportunity to say, I want my life to count more. And, And just press in because this is an invitation from the Son of God to say the rest of your days can be far more of lasting eternal reward than the beginning of your days. And so let's begin with what I call the fact that we will be evaluated for our investments in life. And that is from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And let me begin reading in verse number 9. And it says this, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building." According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Now watch this. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. That's the first word of instruction there. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, and notice this, this is important. Anybody builds on the foundation with gold, silver, or precious stones, that's the first category, and here's the second category, wood, hay, or straw. So let's just stop there for a minute. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Paul is the foundation-laying apostle. Everybody in the church of Corinth became a Christian either directly through Paul's ministry or directly through those that were initially impacted by Paul's ministry. Paul was the apostle. He takes the gospel of Jesus Christ into the heart of paganism in the city of Corinth, where there's all sorts of immoral behavior, all sorts of paganism and worship of multiple gods. And Paul goes in there with the the, the foundation breaking gospel of Jesus Christ, breaks down idolatry, wins people to Jesus, and trains them in the gospel. I think for about 18 months he was in Corinth initially. And then he starts a church, he raises up some leaders, and he says, y'all go after it. And then he goes on to the next place. But while he's there, he is maintaining relationships with them. And the whole letter of first Corinthians, he's writing to adjust problems in the church and to correct bad theology, bad behavior. But one of the things he wants to let them know is what his role was. He even opens up the letter and he's like, some of y'all are choosing parties. Some of y'all are with Peter. Some of y'all are with Apollo. Some of you say you're with me. Some of y'all are super spiritual and you say you don't belong to any leader. You just belong to Jesus. He says, look, none of us were crucified for you. And he says, I want you to press in. And here's my role. I'm the foundation layer. And so he talks about that. And now when he gets here, this is what he's saying to them. He's saying that you have an expectation to invest in the foundation that's been laid in your life. So what Paul is saying to those early Christians there at Corinth, he's saying to us too. He's saying it's not enough just to be comfortable saying, I got my foundation. I've got Jesus. I've been saved. I've been born again. I'm going to heaven when I die. Paul's saying, no, that's where it all begins because you're expected by God to build upon the foundation that God laid through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And so this phrase here um, in in verse number 10, he said, verse number number 10, he says, take care how you build upon it. So right away, we know this. We know that when Paul is talking to the people, He's saying to them, I want you to be intentional about how you are building your life. I want you to be proactive and focusing on what you're doing with your life. Now, what what constitutes your life? Well, it's the same thing that constitutes your life. It's your time. It's your energy. It's your, your abilities. It's your material resources. It's your relationships. It's your opportunities. And what Paul is saying is, now that the foundation has been laid, you're going to build upon it no matter what. And he gives you two different categories. He gives you some worthy investments, and they're represented by gold, by silver, and by precious stones. These are representative of worthy investments of the foundation that's built in your life. And we'll see why they're seen as worthy investments. But the second group represent worthless investments. They're wood, hay, and straw. Now, we've got some builders in the room. We've got some roofers in the room. We've got some contractors in the room. And every one of them could stand up and tell you it matters what materials you build with. 
And now anything can look pretty. You can use some pretty inferior materials and build what they call a facade. It looks good. But when the elements start hitting it, when something happens that is out of the norm, wind, fire, rain, any of that, or just normal occupancy, the materials will reveal what kind of quality they had. And Paul is saying it's the same way with the Christian life. That it's possible to look like a Christian, but to have that life really just framed up with worthless things. And it's also possible to look like a Christian and actually be a deep, robust, steady, strong, valuable, valuable to the kingdom Christian. So let's go a little bit further because verse number 13 explains to us that the investments, the how we build in this Christian life, they're going to be tested. We're actually going to go through a final exam, and in that final exam that Jesus gives us at the end of the age, I don't know exactly how it works, but there will be an instantaneous revelation, and we will all know to what degree our life mattered for the glory of God. It's kind of, kind of intense. This is the way it says it in verse 13. Each one's work, that's each individual Christian, each one's work will become manifest for the day, that's the day of the Lord, that's the second coming, that's where we stand before the Lord, the day will disclose it because it'll be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So again, here's the imagery here. The foundation's solid. What we build upon it is up to us. It's not up to your spouse. It's not up to your parents. It's not up to your spiritual leaders. It's entirely up to you, how you build upon it. And one of the days comes where you check out of here. Your, your ticker stops ticking. It's time to go. Or maybe the Lord himself comes back. But at that point, your building opportunities are over. And now, and all the builders that are in the room in the natural, they know what happens before there can be full and final occupancy. There has to be an inspection. And so the inspection happens, and Jesus is the one who's inspecting it. And the Bible says that he inspects it, and the, the element there is by fire. And so when you see fire in the Bible, it often typifies judgment or evaluation or purifying. And so when the fire of God at the end of the age spans across my entire Christian life, not before I was saved, Stuff we did before we were saved is not even of consequence in the, in the concept of rewards. This is after the foundation has been laid. And so the fire of Jesus Christ testing comes at the judgment seat, and it hits my entire life. Now, what happens in the natural when fire hits wood? Smoke and burning. Same way with wood, straw, hay. Fire hits that, and whoosh, it's gone, eviscerated, our incinerated. It is absolutely God, gone. But when, when fire hits gold, what happens? Purifying. It actually burns off what is unprofitable, and what remains is purified by fire. So the, the wood, hay, and the stubble, that's how I learned it. I learned it in the King James. The ESV calls it wood, hay, and straw. It, it's all burned up, and then the gold and the silver and the precious stones are actually survived the testing and in some sense are actually made more enriched by the fact that they went through the testing of God's holy fire. And then it says each one, verse 13, each one will become manifest. In other words, I'm going to know with no doubt whatsoever what counted in my life and what did not count. And that is going to have an eternal impact on me in the millennium and the kingdom. Now, that's a different message. But listen, one of the things I want you to understand is how you are living your 100 years on earth. People live to 100 now. And how you're living to a hun your 100 years, or let's just say your 60 years as a believer in Jesus Christ, how you live that out actually determines the capacity in which you will exist and function in the eternal state, especially the millennium. Jesus talked about the rewards. Remember the parable of the ten minas, the rewards, the servants, and they were each given a certain amount by their master to take care of while he was gone on a long journey. And when, when they came back, he evaluated, what did you do with what I gave you? And one servant doubled what he gave him, and he said to that servant, you have done amazingly well. I'm going to give you a rule over, I think, ten cities. 
And the other one didn't quite double it, but he still invested in it. He, he used it wisely. He says, all right, you did a good job. I'm going to give you five cities. And then one servant said, I didn't know about you, so I took what you gave me. I just buried it in the sand. It produced nothing, but here's, here's back to you what I gave you. And, and the Lord, the master in that parable, gave him a harsh rebuke. And I don't want to stretch the parable, but that, that parable was given for a reason. And many scholars believe that that could be an allusion to how, because the Bible says that we are going to do what with Jesus in the millennium? We are going to rule and reign. Have you ever thought, who are we ruling and who are we reigning over? You see, there's a touch. And by the way, this is another message too, because we're going to talk about the millennial kingdom. There, there's a reality that people are going to be born in the millennial kingdom that will not necessarily come to Jesus because they're going to actually at some point rebel against him for the final battle against Jesus when Satan is released out of the pit. So Satan's got to have somebody to work with. And it's going to be these people who were born during the millennium who don't come to faith. It's a thousand years a thousand years. Some people, most people will come to faith, some won't. And we're going to rule and reign as, as co-regents with Jesus. And guys, listen, your capacity to rule and reign is being determined by how you're living right now. That's why Jesus could say, oh, y'all don't understand. The last are going to be first. Um, Amy and I joke all the time. We have, we have a great Christian friend. She comes from a third world country. She's one of the sweetest. She's been here a few times. And one of the sweetest women we know in the kingdom. She's got the biggest servant's heart of anybody I've ever met. Uh, she doesn't have a lot materially, but she will give you everything she's got. She just, she, she just kind of seeps Jesus out of her pores. And she just shows almost at times embarrassing kindness to our family just because she operates in love all the time. And Amy and I joke, and we're like, we're going to be cleaning her mansion in the kingdom. We, we will be, we, I'm, and, and it's kind of a joke, but it's kind of not a joke. Because she, uh, I'm thinking to myself, nobody notices her in the day to day. But I watch her life and people that know her watch her life and you can't, you can't mistake the mark of God on her. And so I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing with what he's given me? What am I doing with my time? It's not guilt. It's, it's like motivating. What am I doing with my money? What am I doing with my abilities? What am I doing with my relationships and my opportunities? Because they matter beyond the moment. And so when we're looking at this, we know, oh man, my entire life is going to be evaluated at the end of the age. And look, verses 14 and 15 tell us there's actually a return on our investment. As we're investing down here, there's going to be a, a, a return. This is what Paul taught. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, survives the fire, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So let's just pause here for a minute. Here's a promise in the word of God. That what we do for the glory of God, no matter if anybody down here notices, no matter if there's an immediate impact, no matter whether or not there is um, obvious fruit or not, this is what we need to remember. God watches, not with like, oh, just don't step out of line or I'm going to get you. No, God watches with a father's heart and he loves it. When we do secret anonymous works, he loves that because he gets to reward us openly for what we do secretly. But he doesn't mind the public works. Not all works can be done in hiddenness. But when we are motivated for his glory... When, when our desire is to do something in love that enriches the body of Christ or helps unbelievers know Christ, when we represent in the home, when we are, are in the marketplace, when we're in the schools, when we do those, remember the old bumper sticker, random acts of kindness. When we, when we do those things that are intentional to bless, God looks at that and he's, he makes a promise, I will reward you. And so it, it, it helps to shift our motivations. Because I'm going to tell you, we're told in the Bible not to get weary in well-doing. You know why we often get weary in well-doing? Because we don't find it, it's appreciated by people. Now, I know none of y'all have ever struggled with that, but for the people that are watching on live stream, I'm sure they have. But no, 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 just kidding, folks at home. But the point is this. If, if, if we are doing what we are doing to be pleased and approved and applauded or, or appreciated by other people, then we're doing it for the wrong reason. And there is no reward in that. 
But the simplest thing, the most basic thing, sometimes the most secret thing or the thing that was big to you but wasn't big to anybody else, God sometimes leans over and he whispers. He's like, I got you on that. I saw that. And remember, I told you I'd reward you and I will. The converse is also true. That there's going to be people that stand before the Lord. And these are all saved people. These are not pagans. These are not God haters. There's only one category of standing here. It's saved people. But these saved people lived very differently. Some lived and built their lives for the glory of Jesus. Sacrifice, proper motivation, desire for his glory. Others were in some way haphazard with their life. They lived for the world. They lived for self. They lived for lesser loyalties. Or they did outwardly righteous things to be accepted, approved, and blessed by man. And the Lord says, yeah, when the fire hits that life, clear, open up a window, there's going to be a lot of smoke at the judgment seat of Christ. And so here's the one thing that I, I, I want to remember. I get to determine what happens at the judgment seat. Like, that's a big deal. What, what, an, what an entrusting, like, I, I believe strongly in the sovereignty of God. Like, I'd scare some of y'all how much I believe in the sovereignty of God. Um, I believe so strongly in it, but God is not sovereign to the extent that what we do, we're on puppet strings, and whatever we do must have been the will of God. God literally empowers you with choice. He empowers you with the freedom to determine what you're going to do with all the things that I've mentioned, your time, your energy, your gifts, your relationships, your opportunities, your finances. He's like, I, I, I'm going to receive all, anything you want to do for my glory, and I'm going to bless it, but I'm not going to make you do it. You get to decide, and what you decide will be reflected at the judgment seat of Christ. And so it's kind of empowering to me because you know what it means? It, it matters what you're doing with your life. Like what you're doing with your life is like radically important to God and it reverberates beyond your four score and 10 years here on planet earth. And so I think, and when we're, we're living in a generation where, you know, this is the me generation, we are the selfie generation. And that's, that's fairly consistent with what scripture says the end of the age will look like men will be lovers of their own selves. And so the selfie thing to me, it's kind of cutesy, whatever, but it's actually, to me, it's an indicator. Oh, wow. We actually have the word on our generation. It's about me. It's about us. It's about look at me. And we get to come out of that. We get to be counterculture people that say, no, it's actually not about me. It's actually about the son of God. It's actually about his fame. It's actually about his name. It's actually about his kingdom. And every resource that I have at my disposal, he's given me the freedom to be a wise, faithful steward to not to ruin my life so I don't get to enjoy anything because Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and said, God has given us all things richly to enjoy. But the, the understanding is this, the more we use our lives for his glory, the more we'll enjoy our lives. Are y'all with me tonight? Okay. It's funny in this series, I've, I've kind of looked out there and I, there are moments where I'm like, they're terrified, bored, or confused. I don't know which one at any moment, but somebody told me last week, no, we're just, we're pressing in, we're listening. So I'm going to trust that. So um, let me give you a couple of just statements before, because we're still in the first passage. Have mercy. Um, God's salvation is entirely free for those who believe on Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that saves you. You are not saved by good works. You're not. It's 100% what Jesus has done for you when you believe that. And that belief is not just a, "Mm, I believe that. It's a, ooh, I believe that, therefore I bow. It's a, it's a, it's a radical belief. It's a transformational belief. Um, that, that secures your salvation. It's completely free, but rewards aren't. Rewards are not free. They're not a free gift. Rewards, hear me on this, are earned. You don't hear that in churches very often because we don't ever want to mess with anything that might throw shade on the doctrines of grace. But rewards are not simply God's grace. Rewards are what we get for responding properly to God's grace. And guess what? They're all earned. 
I say this all the time. I, my family's so kind. Sometimes they'll say, Dad, you said that again. They've been listening to my sermons. Alicia's been listening to it for 22 years, Amy 25 years, and Landon for 17, so they've heard all my stuff. But um, I'm going to say it again. The everybody gets a trophy generation. You know, I don't want to offend any of y'all, but that's silly. That's silly. I want kids to be encouraged, but I also want kids to learn that it matters what you put in. Like there are winners in sports and losers in sports. And I'll just be honest with you. Um, some of us are wired by God. We want to win. My coach used to tell me, it's not whether you win or lose. It's, I'm like, I never believed that. I was third grade. I was like, that's a lie. That's a straight up lie. It's like, why do you always play your best players and let me ride the bench? You know, <laughs> if it's just how you play. So my point is, this: the kingdom is, is not whether you win or lose. If, if Jesus said, I want your life to count so I can reward it, it matters that we win. And the choice is entirely ours. And so, listen, I don't, I don't want to mess with your understanding of salvation, but we're not talking about salvation. But for the glory of God, go earn some rewards. Like, don't, don't be, don't, don't fail and say, well, I'm not motivated by that. Well, in some form or fashion, we are allowed to be motivated by the fact that our lives can count and gain reward because even in the eternal state, the rewards, we're going to know. We're going to know that any reward we get was because of what Jesus did. But it's just a divine aspect that he offers us to enjoy our salvation beyond just staying down here. Well, I'm glad I go to heaven. All right, let me go a little bit further. So um, this issue of suffering loss, I, I do want to just sit there for a second. Because if it's in the Bible, I'm, I'm, I'm like, and it is in the Bible, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Loss of what? Loss of reward. Loss of potential reward. But listen, it actually seems to be indicated in Scripture that you can earn rewards and later forfeit them. This is intense. Second John verse 8. This will not be in your notes, so you can write it down. Second John only has one chapter. And in verse number 8, listen to what John said. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. And then you've got Revelation 3.11. He also, Jesus also said something similar in Revelation 2. But in Revelation 3.11, Jesus says this. I'm coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that nobody may take your crown. And so you've got this, this understanding that, okay, re rewards can be earned. And we're never told, well, what, what do I have to do to forfeit one of my rewards? We're not told. But we are told that you can in some way respond to life or to other people or to even false teaching because the context in 2 John is in the context of false prophets and false teaching that you can start out well and then veer off and you lose all of your rewards. So enduring unto the end is not just a phrase. It actually has a practical application. So guys, I think about this. I'm like, you know, I don't know. I don't know if there have been seasons where I've gained rewards and then had some kind of faith lapse in some area of my life and lost those. I don't know, but I know it's in the Bible for the reason. There's a reason for that being in there. Jesus said it. John warned about it. And I'm thinking, I don't want, I mean, we're having to be exhorted here. Don't let anybody steal your reward. Don't let anybody undermine what God's doing in your life. And so it seems to have a relational aspect to it that we've got to stay fixated on the Lord. We've got to stay fixated on the big picture. We've got to stay fixated on the throne and the coming of the Son of God and recognize that we're not done yet. We may be saved, but we're not done yet. And so I don't want to start well. It's not how a person starts. It's how they finish that actually counts. Our testimony. Listen, I was heartbroken. Um, I don't even want to mention his name, but a very, very prominent apologist. Um, I think it was last year or the year before who I used to follow his ministry. He's the most brilliant man I've ever heard speak in my life. It's brilliant intellectually brilliant, spiritually mild temperament and everything. And I thought, this is a hero of the faith. And when, when he died, all of this horrible stuff came out about his life. And I wasn't just wondering if he lost his reward. I was wondering, was he ever even saved? 
And if he was saved, and I pray that he was, he definitely lost his reward. Why? Because it matters how you live. It matters how we live today. It matters what comes out of our mouth. It matters how we treat people. It matters how we interact with one another. It actually all matters. And the beauty of it is this. We don't have to walk on eggshells in fear. Jesus says, just live for my glory. Intentionally live for my glory. And I will reward you. And that's, I don't know that there's a better thing. I I don't know, man. Maybe, sorry, I'm externally processing a little bit. I'm like, is it, do you just want to go to heaven? Is that, I mean, just like, I just want to go to heaven. Is, but what if there's more? Like, there is more. And so, if he has more for us, why would I ever think, believe, or live in a way that just says, don't go for the more? So, I want to experience everything that he has for us. So, point number two. Y'all are awesome, midweek service. Y'all put up with lots of words. Um, here's how we are motivated for our investments. And some of this will be overlapping with what I just shared, but 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Paul gives us this happy, I, there's two components to our motivation. Here's the happy, happy component. Whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. What he's talking about is whether we are here living life or we are in glory, our desire, what drives our life, our motivational force is this. We want to bring pleasure to the Lord. Like that is what being a Christian is. Being a Christian, church is great. I love coming to church. You'll see me here all the time if you show up. I love it. But that's not the sum total of being a Christian. Um, I I like serving. I like preaching. I even like singing. I'm not that great at it, but I enjoy doing it. I like fellowshipping. I like praying. I I, I like all of the activities. The activities are great. I wasted the first 24 years of my life doing bad stuff. And so when I found out there's healthy, holy, wonderful things to do, I like all the activity. I like the people of God. I mean, I, I like Christians. We frustrate each other sometimes, but I like Christians. But that's not the sum total of the Christian life. What the motivating force is not more church, more sermons, more Bible study, more, you know, works and more giving and more. That's not really the motivation. Those are streams that come from the motivation. What is the core motivation of the Christian life? I want my life to bring pleasure to the one that loves me most. Like that's it. That's what it means to be in love with Jesus. And it doesn't happen accidentally. You, you can be saved, and, and if you don't intentionally press into that, that place of saying, I just want to bring pleasure. That's what it says. We, our aim is to please the Lord. That means to bring pleasure to him. And if we don't make that our intentional goal, then we typically drift with whatever the, the strongest current is moving around us. But when we decide, oh, no, no, no. Today, I'm going to please Jesus with, in my home. Today, I'm going to please Jesus in my job. Today, I'm going to please Jesus with how I speak. Today, Lord, I just want to bring pleasure. I want you to feel pleased when I get in this conflict and how I respond. I've been, I, I've been like really working on that for the last few weeks, just saying, Lord, I, I want let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, oh God. And I don't know the, any Christian that just does that without making it a priority. And so that's the, when, when we're living this life down here, and by the way, if you live to please the Lord down here, you will please the Lord down here. You're going to please him. And here's the beautiful thing. He says, oh, I'm, I'm going to reward that. So you not only get the pleasure of pleasing him, you get the pleasure eternally of being rewarded for pleasing him. And the whole thing in the first place brought you pleasure. And I'm like, where, where's, the, where's the, down, the downward part of that? That's, oh, that's a big win. Like the happiest life is a life of a Christian who knows she's living to please the Lord. And she, she begins to sense his pleasure. Some people are trying to serve the Lord to get, ple- to, to, to get his affirmation. And what you need to know is like when you, you've just made up your mind that you're his and you're going to live for him, he's, he's happy with you. 
and, and you don't do it to get something out of him. You live to please him because he already gave you everything. So it's not a bartering system. It's a gratitude expression. So, oh man, since you gave me your best when I was at my worst, while, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Like, we're at our worst. He gives us our best, his best. Like, he doesn't have anything better to give us than Jesus. And he gave it to you when you were at your least deserving moment. And he gave you Jesus first. And now it's just like, oh, I don't have to work to get anything more from him. But I get to serve him as an expression of my gratitude. And the Lord says, I like that. I like that. That brings me pleasure. Now, the... That's the happy component of our motivation, but there is a heavy component of our motivation. And again, it's verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5. I'm not taking verse 9 out of context because look at verse 10. We must all appear before the bema seat of Christ, the bema of Christ, the judgment seat, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in his body, whether good or evil. Now that scares some people because they're like, hold on, preacher man. You said our sins were judged at Calvary. What's this we're going to receive, whether we've done good or evil? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me give you a short Greek study. you got two primary words that are used for evil deeds or moral evil in the Bible. Uh, porneo, which sounds like a word we all know. And then you've got a word called uh, kakos, K-A-K-O-S. And that just means, means um, unhealthy, bad, almost a repugnant. That's not the word that Paul uses here in the Greek language. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to use the word phallos, which is a word that means worthless or useless. It's not morally good or evil. It just means it didn't have any value. So let's go back and read that. We must all receive what is due for what we've done in the body, whether it is good or useless. And so it's not an issue of of sins being judged, it's an issue, again, what we've already talked about. The evaluating fire of God hits the, the, the entirety of your life at the judgment seat, and what survives the fire, the good survives the fire. The worthless wood, hay, stubble, burnt up. And so again, we're just told here, it's kind of heavy, but guys, listen, I mean, sometimes we, we need to be reminded, hey, we're accountable. Like your life's supposed to count. And it should count because he's worthy of our lives counting. So what constitutes whether something is good or evil? I'm going to give you four things. You can write them down if you want to or just listen. They're not in your notes on the screen. But um, when the fire hits my life and the fire hits your life at the judgment seat of Christ, um, part of what's going to be evaluated will be your motivation. And I've already covered that a little bit. Why did you do the good things you did? Was it intentionally for his glory? Or was it for something else? Only you can decide. By the way, you're, you're, not, you're not qualified to judge anybody else's motivation. You know, we think we're pretty good at judging somebody else's motivation. You're actually not qualified. You're not, you're not omniscient. You, you, you've never seen a motivation. Not in anybody else. You can, you can judge yours. And you might be suspicious of somebody else's motivation. One of the things I've disciplined myself uh, over the years to do is even when I'm I kind of wondering, like, I think maybe they might be doing that for something other than glory of Lord. I just feel that gentle hand, hand slap, like the Lord saying, hands off. You're not qualified to touch that. I'm like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will not judge anybody's motivation, but I will judge my own. The second thing is the action. What did you actually do? So you got the motivation will be evaluated and the actual action. What did you proactively do with what you were given? Because we're not all given the same stuff. Some of y'all have like mega talent. Some of you have lesser talent. Some of you have lots of resources, finances. Some of you have lots of time. Some of you have lots of relational IQ and bandwidth. You flow in your relationships. And others of us are what I call love stutterers. Like we, 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 want, to, we want to flow in love, but we tend to stutter on it. And, and listen, to whom much is given, much is what? Required. So that means if you have a God-given elevated amount of something in your life, more is expected of you in that area. And so if, if you have wisdom, God says, I didn't give you that wisdom so you could sit around and feel wise. Share the wisdom. If you've got time, listen, to me, that's the most precious thing. Like, what are we doing with our time? Because it's going to be evaluated. What are we doing with our money? Um, 
You know, people ask me regularly, you didn't ask for this tonight, but I'll throw it in there. And no, we're not taking up an offering. But, but people are like, do I have to tithe? And this is what I tell them. I said, I've never tithed. You don't tithe? Oh. And they're thinking, thank God, I don't have to give 10% of my income. I said, no, the tithe is way too low. I'm like, no, the tithe, that's like an Old Testament kind of thing. And I've got way more than Moses had. Why would I let an Old Testament saint out give me? It's not about a percentage. It's about proportional giving. See, proportion is give as you've been blessed. Percentage is just do the math and write a check. And it's harder to worship that way. And so whether it's money or time or relational bandwidth or spiritual gifts, like here's, here's a thought. I'm just, this, forget the outline. I'm, I'm trying so hard. I just, um, this is my personal belief. You don't have to believe this. When I see like stunning vocals in the secular world, like when I hear people that hit notes and have great singing ability, I think to myself, and I'm not judging hearts at all because I don't know who's saved or not, but I'm thinking that voice was given by God for his glory. And I'm thinking, oh, where, what in the world could be done if that voice was harnessed, that human gift was harnessed and intentionally given expression for the glory of God. So I think like that. When I see somebody, like I'm, I, I love good communicators and uh, there's, there's plenty out in the marketplace and in the world and philosophy and you know, secular psychiatry and teaching and all of that stuff. And I'm thinking, oh, that gift, that innate gift that was given, if it could only be applied to, to expressing the scriptures. And then I see people that are like relational gurus. And this, this may offend some people. But the, like even in the church, it's like, People are just so relationally wired, but they, they idolatry, they, they make an idol out of the family and they're only relational within their family. It's family idolatry. And they don't, they don't take that expression of love and grace and fluidity and connecting and bring it outside of their household and, and bring it into the church. They just kind of stay us for and no more kind of thing. And I'm thinking, God, we're going to give an account for that. And so... You've got motivation, you've got action, and then you've got the third thing, reliance. What are you relying upon? His empowering or some lesser resource? Like the reason why some of you are able to go beyond what you ever thought you would be able to do, like you can go longer sometimes, you can go deeper sometimes, you can go um, stronger sometimes, and you're like at the end of the week or the month or the year, you're like, how did we do this? It's because you've learned how to rely on his power. And you don't lean on crutches. And listen, God doesn't mind our weakness. He doesn't. He tells us, hey, look, don't get weary while you're doing well. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't rebuke us for feeling the weariness. He calls us, he commissions us not to give in to it. And so when we're relying on his strength, like, so, some of us in the body of Christ, we can do junk in our own power that looks spiritual, but we're doing it in our own power. And so God has to entrust some, some brokenness to us sometimes. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying God sadistically hurts his kids. I don't believe that at all. But there, there, is, there is, you know, Jacob wrestled with God and lost the match, but won the covenant. And he walked with a limp the rest of his life. And every step he took, he said, I've seen the face of God. I've seen the face of God. I've seen the face of God. And if you ask Jacob in glory, was it worth it? He'll say, what are you talking about, man? Of course it was worth it. Did, did the wrestling match leave him with a limp? It did. But it also changed his name from the deceiver to the prince. And so when we think on these things, it's like, Okay, yeah, we've got weaknesses, but does the weakness cause you to despair or does the weakness cause you to depend? If your weakness causes you to depend, you're, you're, you're growing and God's going to continue to bless and use you. If your weakness causes you to despair, it means because you're thinking you're supposed to do all of this stuff on your own. And that leads to burnout. And of course, that's the last part. 
to endure. So motivation, action, what you're relying upon as you're living and building on the foundation and then enduring unto the end. So just a quick word. Um, you're not done yet. You're just not done yet. So how do you know? Because you're alive. If you have a brainwave and a pulse in here, you are not done. He's not done with you yet. Like you can retire from your job, but there is no kingdom retirement. There isn't. Because if he was done using you, he would, <laughs> he would usher you into glory. And so the fact that we're in the room tonight lets me know that there's probably, I don't, I don't know, about 7,500 people in here, maybe, maybe 50, 100. I don't know, I'm terrible at that. But however many there are in here, I, I, all I know is right now is there's every person represents an ongoing purpose of God in this generation. So you can be tired and maybe you're a little discouraged. Some of you might be. Some of you could be confused. Some of you may not know what your purpose is yet, but, but will you press in and just believe that he's got something for you? So let me squeeze in. I got nine minutes. Can, if I talk fast, y'all can stay awake. So here we go. The last thing. Romans 14. By the way, Romans 14 is all about relationships. It's about relational conflict. It's about judging others. It's about feeling superior. It's about choosing humility. Romans 14 is huge. And in, right in the middle of Romans 14, Paul starts talking about the judgment seat of Christ. So I'm, I, my attention is grabbed because what I'm, what I'm seeing is the, the evaluation of my life at the judgment seat of Christ is not detached from my human relationships. So now that I have your attention, look at verse number 10 in Romans 14. It'll be up on the screen. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I love this. The fact that we have an appointment of evaluation before the Lord, Paul says, if you'll remember that, you won't waste your time judging other people. That's exactly what he's teaching. He's saying, hey, noticed you over there judging her. And ma'am, I saw you judging him. Did you forget? You're going to give an account for one thing only at the judgment seat. And you're going to give an account for you and you're going to give an account for you. And I don't think y'all need to waste time judging one another. Now, that doesn't mean we're mute and silent over things that God says are unholy and sinful. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about when Christians joust, when they're debating and fighting over things that don't have eternal value, and ultimately they're indicting one another's heart. And Paul says, the people that do that have lost connection with the fact that they're going to give an account for every idle word, and they're going to give an account for every wasted hour. And they're going to give an account for whether or not they loved like Jesus loves. You know what's interesting about Jesus? Um, everywhere he went, he saw what was wrong with every person he encountered. See how rarely he said anything about it. Now, who was he the toughest on? That's and what were they known for doing? Judging people. So Jesus' harshest indictments were not for the immoral. They weren't for the, the, the terribly, you know, sexually broken or the covetous or the thief. Matter of fact, he said, y'all want to join my, my, my tribe? He's like, repent, believe, I will heal you. I will, I will minister to your woundedness. Come on out of the, the judgment of religion and become one of my disciples. He welcomed those people. I mean, literally, I'm sitting here thinking, I can't remember a single instance in Scripture where Jesus got in the face of an immoral person. But I can find many places in Scripture where he got in the face of judgmental religious people. I mean, when was the last time you called somebody a snake or a viper? Like, Jesus did that. But what's amazing to me is everywhere he went, I mean, if he's walking in here right now, he sees everything that's wrong with everybody. So if the one who had the greatest clarity on what was messed up in other people chose not to go around with a scorecard addressing everybody's problems, why do we do that? How did that become our flavor of Christianity? Maybe not church at Winder, but just in general. I think there's something to be learned there because ultimately, if we remember that we're going to give an account, let's just make, this may not even sound spiritual. 
I am overly concerned about that appointment that I'm going to have with Jesus that I don't have the bandwidth nor the desire to walk around figuring out what's wrong with you. I don't. And it's not that we don't see what's wrong with each other sometimes, but good night. All I've got to do is spend 30 minutes in a self-inventory, and I guarantee you the Lord can show me a dozen things that aren't yet where they need to be in my life. And the more I'm aware of that, the more I can look at you and love you in your incompleteness and brokenness and not judge you for it, but help you where I'm welcome to. But nobody here is the sheriff of Christian town. Patrolling the streets, making sure that Pastor Kent's doing what Pastor Kent ought to do over here. That's just not Christianity. And so in verse 11, Romans 14, 11, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So again, it's the Lordship principle. Like if you get a grasp of that, it's incredibly motivating. Like he's a very kind master. But he's not playing around. He's like, yeah, I saved you for my glory. Cooperate with that. It'll bless you. I mean, that's what I hear from the Lord. It's just all the time. It's like, Jeff, I'm not asking you to live for my glory because I want to ruin your life. I actually want to impart greater life to you as you live for my glory. And so we're going to, if, 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 the, if the consensus of heaven is that everybody bows to Jesus and everybody confesses that he's Lord to God, let's don't just confess it. Let's live it. And then finally, verse 12, it says, so then, it's just a summary statement, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. If you have a paper Bible, which like maybe four of you do, just circle of himself. I'm going to give an account of myself. That's heavy. And so in Romans 14, again, he's saying, y'all don't have time to be like jousting with each other. You need to remember your only government. This will free some of y'all up. To anybody, theoretically, that might listen to this message online in a year, this is where this is going. If any of those people, theoretically, nobody in here, but theoretically, are a control freak, this frees them up. Those people, not y'all. These people get freed up from trying to control people by recognizing, oh, I can let you be wrong because I'm never going to give an account for you. I tell this in marriage counseling all the time. I don't do marriage counseling more, but when I did marriage counseling, that every, every single couple is the same when they're in a conflict. They're, they're fully aware of what the other person's doing wrong and, and completely can justify why, what, what they're doing is not jacked up, but their spouse is jacked up. And so I, I tell, tell them all the time, I was like, ma'am, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is not nagging. No husband was ever nagged into holiness. Or saying, it just never happened. It's like, oh, for one million. It just no, no track record. Was it? I said, and you're not actually going to give an answer for him. You're actually, but you are going to give an answer for how you responded to what's lacking in him. And, and I've, seen, I've seen wives get liberated. I'm not picking on the women there, but that's just typically what it is because men can be late, spiritually lazy at times and apathetic and the wife's trying to run for Jesus, but she's chained to the guy who don't want to move and, and she's like, I, I can just point out the other 25 things that frustrate me about him. I'm sure he'll respond favorably. And all it does is drag him down. I'm just like, why don't you let him be wrong and you work on you? And I have flipped that. And listen, people get set free. Some of you, I'm just going to end with this. Some of you, the key to your joy moving forward is for you to be freed up, freed up to only focus on what you're going to give an account for and to free others up that they're going to give an account for themselves. I promise you, it will stoke the fires of your joy because you will turn in your badge you will no longer feel responsible for what other people are doing. It doesn't have to be just marriages. It can happen in the church. Like, you know, times of conflict, I'm only going to give an answer for what I did in times of conflict in the church. And I will give an answer. That's enough to kind of keep me sobered. And, uh, and if I think somebody else is wrong, I can't fix that. Same way with you guys. And so thinking about the judgment seat of Christ as you get up and you go to work tomorrow, you go to take care of the kids tomorrow, the grandkids or whatever it is that you've got to do, be aware of your motivation. When it comes to the action, what you actually do, do the right thing. Do it in his power because some of you have heavy loads. 
you've got heavy loads. You carry it on the inside because of life's difficulties, circumstantial difficulties. I'm not making light of that. But I'm telling you, you're not supposed to be able to hold everything together. Be free from that. And I know that's difficult because some people are like, if I, if, if I don't hold it together, man, there's going to be consequences. Sometimes you just have to let the consequences come. Because eventually, if you're not supposed to be holding everything together, you will run out of strength and the consequences come later. And then the, the, the final thing is just endurance. Is he worth getting up and doing it all over again tomorrow? <laughs> it's like an actual question. I'm, I'm panicking. <laughs> I'm like, I need to do an altar call and get some folks saved here. But yeah, he's, he's actually worth getting up and doing it tomorrow. And here's the good thing. You can. God's not actually hard to please. He really isn't. God, we're harder to please than God. God's already shed his pleasure and his love on us. And all he's doing is saying, will you let me help you respond? Can I, can I grow you? Can I stretch you? Can I get in there with you? And you're like, Lord, I, I can't do this on my own. He's like, yeah, you were actually never supposed to. So how about you and I do this together? And when it's all over, my daughter, when it's all over, my son, I'm going to reward everything you did. I will never forget a single thing you did. And to me, man, that's like, okay, bring on Thursday. I am ready to rock and roll. Amen.